Hey everybody, let's go tide pooling. We just drove from Westminster Woods to Shell Beach, just a bit south of where the Russian River meets the Pacific Ocean. It's only about 10 or 15 miles away from the woods, but here we get to explore a completely different ecosystem. Creatures living at the edge of the ocean have to deal with tides. About twice a day, the water level goes up and down. So sometimes this area behind me is completely covered in water, and sometimes it's not. The gravitational pulls of the sun and moon control these tides. And when the tide goes out, the water pools and tide pools around these rocks. And there's a lot of really cool organisms that we can explore and observe. Every ecosystem has its own challenges. Creatures living in tide pools have to deal with wave shock, living in and out of water, competition for space, and finding food while avoiding being food. First, let's consider wave shock. Organisms that live in tide pools are pounded by 8,000 waves per day. What structures or behaviors do you think might help them survive that? Organisms might avoid waves by running, swimming, flying away, or hiding under or between rocks. Some animals have structures that help them hold onto the rock and keep from getting washed away. Some creatures are rubbery to bend with the waves. Others have hard body parts like shells to protect them from waves. Tidepool organisms also have to deal with living in and out of water. The intertidal zone is covered with ocean water part of the time and exposed to the air part of the time. That means that sometimes organisms are in really cold water and sometimes they're out in the hot sun, which means they need to be able to survive both of those temperatures. They also get their oxygen from the water, not from the air. So even when they're exposed to the air, they need to be able to keep on getting oxygen from the water. What are some ways that you think organisms might be able to do that? Some animals move around and follow the tide, so they're always in the water. Other organisms are stuck in one place, so they have behaviors and body structures that can prevent them from drying up. In the intertidal zone, organisms also have to deal with competition for space. The area between low tide and high tide is not very wide. How do you think organisms might be able to deal with this real estate shortage? Where do they find places to live? Some live on top of other organisms, like on a shell. Some organisms live high on the rock where it's dry and it's harder for competing organisms to survive. And finally, something all organisms have to deal with is finding food while avoiding being food. How do you think these organisms might get their food? What about creatures that are stuck to a rock? How would they find food? And how do you think these organisms might protect themselves from predators? Some animals have structures that they put out when underwater to grab and filter food, and then they can pull them back in once they're dry again. Some organisms that are stuck in one place have structures that help them defend from predators that want to eat them. When we think about structures and behaviors that help populations of organisms survive in their habitat, we're talking about adaptations. Adaptations are characteristics that are inherited. They're passed on from parents to offspring through genes. It's pretty easy to understand how body structures like a shell or eyes might be inherited, but some behaviors like breathing and flinching are also inherited. Here's a way you can explore adaptations from tide pool organisms. First, you wanna observe some organisms in a tide pool. You don't actually have to go to the beach to do that. You can just watch some of the videos that we've recorded for you. 
Draw a picture with some labels about the structures and behaviors that you observe. Then list the structures and behaviors in a chart like this. After that, you can look at the structures and behaviors and start to think about how they might help a creature survive. When you're doing that, you're creating an explanation. Make sure that when you're creating your explanation, you're using evidence to support your claims. After you're done with that, you can find someone to share your notes with. Sharing your ideas and discussing ideas other people come up with can help you learn. Maybe you'll revise your opinions and come up with a new explanation. Or maybe someone will point out some more evidence that supports your original explanation. Well, I think we're ready for some more exploration. Let's go out and see how organisms deal with wave shock, living in and out of water, competition for space, and finding food while avoiding being food.